Let's pray. Lord, what sweet truths to sing. We are indebted wholly and totally to your grace. Your grace which looked upon us in our helpless state, paid the purchase price for our redemption. Your grace which teaches us to deny ungodliness. Your grace which secures our home. And Lord, we think about ourselves, we recognize our frailty, our weakness, inclinations we still have towards sin. And we feel acutely our smallness. We feel acutely our distractedness. How easy is it for us to look away from that which is infinitely valuable? eternally precious and to gaze on lesser things to have our affections pulled by temporal things even things that you will destroy and our hearts are too small for you O Lord even as Solomon's temple was too small to house the eternal God and you have poured out grace upon grace to the undeserving What a great truth it is to look to you as one with arms open wide, ready to receive all who would come to you in simple faith. And we do so now looking to you as our maker, our redeemer, even our friend. Lord, we come to your word asking for help by your Holy Spirit to see what you would have for us. May you be glorified in this time. May we be built up. For your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to begin this morning with a story. And I'll read it to you. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that land. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? And I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry. He was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. 
But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, he has devoured your wealth with prostitutes. You killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice For this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. We hear in this story the heart of our God toward the restoration of a wayward son. We're in part six of seven this morning of our series on caring for each other in the body of Christ. And last week we looked at all of our role in church discipline. This morning we'll be looking at our role in discipline restoration. And you remember that the goal of the church discipline process, that process that Jesus laid out to help a brother see a blind spot of sin, the goal was to win your brother. And the disposition in that process is one of hope even in what seems to be impossible cases. In fact, think about all the texts of the New Testament that demand a removal of someone from the body of Christ. Removals for unrepentant sin, for false teaching, for factions. The disposition in all of these is to be hope. Listen to the refrain again in Matthew 18. If he listens, you have won your brother. Even in 2 Timothy 2.25, detailing the procedure for false teachers. We read this a number of weeks ago. God says, the Lord's slave must be kind, patient, and gentle with those in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. In 2 Thessalonians 3, we get the case of the undisciplined busybody who won't work. In verse 14, Paul tells them, do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. And listen to the next verse, yet do not regard him as an enemy. In other words, hope is not lost. Admonish him as a brother. All of this process is to be carried out in love, governed by obedience to Christ and hope for the sinning brother or sister. Every category of removal from the church is to be accompanied by hope for return, for restoration, for repentance. So the question for us this morning is simply this, what should the church's disposition be toward the repentant brother? How should we feel about it when the sinning brother turns, turns back. We're going to take our cues this morning from the heart of the Apostle Paul and his instructions to the church at Corinth. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And this morning we'll be studying the details of verses 5 to 11. And my hope is that we will see what is at stake in our eagerness to see a brother return. Listen to Paul's words, 2 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 5. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority. So that, on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Therefore, I urge you, reaffirm your love for him. For to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his schemes. The instructions here in 2 Corinthians 2 follow on the heels of the instructions Paul gave to the church at Corinth 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want you to turn back one letter that we need to see what was going on at Corinth, what was being addressed by the Apostle Paul there in that church that needed this additional instruction in 2 Corinthians. So we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll read the first 13 verses. And I will, as an introduction to this, read the last verse of chapter 4. So beginning in chapter 4, verse 21, Paul asks the Corinthian church, What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? You can sense already the urgency and the tension in Paul's writing here. Chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you. And immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. That someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant. And you have not mourned instead. So that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who was so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Clean out the old leaven, so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of the world or with the covetous or swindlers or idolaters. Then you'd have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or idolater or reviler or drunkard or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? Those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. These are strong words from the pen of the Apostle Paul. Paul himself said they were tear filled. This was a hard letter to write. Paul here was addressing in the Corinthian church an egregious sin. Egregious even by the immoral standards of the city of Corinth. It was known in the day to Corinthianize. It was to be characterized by a life of immorality. But this sin went over the top even by their standards. This was a public scandal in the church. There were wounded people. Their corporate witness was compromised. There was a contagion of moral laxity. And there were cripplingly wrong attitudes towards sin and holiness in the church. And the church had failed to apply the Matthew 18 process. They did not heed Jesus' instructions for how to deal with sin in the church. And this in an egregious situation. A very clear case. So they were disobedient to Jesus' directives and it was costing the church dearly. And Paul had to address the issue sharply in the midst of many sharp correctives that come in the letter to 1 Corinthians. Now, in between the writing of 1 and 2 Corinthians, Paul got reports from Timothy and from Titus about the state of the church. And it is evident in those reports that the church followed Paul's directive. They expelled the immoral man. And at some point, the man repented. By the time Paul writes 2 Corinthians, he has forsaken his sin and has returned to the Lord. This was gospel victory but the church at Corinth had not yet reinstated him and now the church must be instructed what to do with him I like to refer to 2 Corinthians 2 as step 5 of the Matthew 18 process 
The first four steps are laid out in Jesus' instructions there. If your brother sins, go to him in private. If he doesn't listen to you, take two or three. If he doesn't listen to the two or three, tell it to the church. If he doesn't listen to the church, treat him as an outsider. Those are steps one through four. And what happens then if he repents, having been handed over to Satan for the sifting of his flesh, that his soul might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus? What if it works after he's removed? This is step five. Perhaps the believers at Corinth were hesitant to welcome the prodigal brother back into full fellowship. Maybe they wanted to know how Paul felt about it. Perhaps there were some who believed that so egregious a public sin deserved some tangible punitive response over time. And Paul's instructions to them make it clear that when there is genuine repentance, the wayward brother is to be received with open arms and warm hearts. Observe with me together this morning five features of the church's disposition toward a repentant brother. First feature is found in verse 5. Not harboring personal offenses. Not harboring personal offenses. Look at verse 5. Paul writes, if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, to all of you. Now Paul is very careful with his words here. He he wants to make a point, but he doesn't want to make too much of a point. Don't, Don't run away with the first part of what he's saying without hearing the nuance and the falling back in the second half. He talks about sorrow here in verse 5. If anyone has caused sorrow, he's caused sorrow not to me, but caused sorrow to you. This is a prominent theme in 2 Corinthians. You remember that Paul opens this letter, 2 Corinthians 1, with the discussion of sorrow. Sorrow so deep and so grievous that Paul said he despaired even of his own life. And here, related to the sorrow caused by an unrepentant brother in the church and a disobedient church that would not remove him, Paul dislocates the issue from personal offense. Paul makes it clear that he's not the one most grieved. Notice what he says, if anyone has caused sorrow, it's not been to me. Now, Paul later in this letter would tell who who sins in the church without me being burdened. It's very clear that Paul's pastoral heart and apostolic burden cared for the church. He felt it when the church hurt and he was grieved when believers sinned. But here Paul takes it out of the realm of personal offense. What was on Paul's mind most? Grief to the church. The sorrow that has been caused, says Paul, is not first and most his sorrow, but a collective sorrow for the whole church. And just catch Paul's heart here. He feels deeply when the church is harmed. He's willing to put his own feelings in the back seat. And the reality is the whole church was harmed by the man's sin. When a man stiff arms the church, he, he successively removes the church from his life by not repenting. When, when one comes to him in love in private, and then when two or three come to him in private, and then the whole church leading to expulsion because he will not let go of his sin. When this happens, the whole church suffers. Not only at the loss of a precious member of the body of Christ, but also the, the effects that this sin causes in the church. Even then, Paul doesn't want to say too much. He he doesn't say here in verse 5, instead of thinking about little old Paul, you should think and contemplate and meditate on how much all y'all have been harmed. No, Paul doesn't create an army of victims here. Just think about your sorrows, church, and everything this guy has done to it. No. Here in verse 5, Paul says, in order not to say too much, sorrow to all of you. He doesn't want to overstate this. He doesn't want to put them in a position where they feel vindictive and he doesn't want the repentant brother to be overwhelmed by sorrow. Paul wants to dislocate himself from personal offense and at the same time not cause the church to think too much about their own grief. Listen, in 1 Corinthians 5, the church did not feel sorrow when they should have. 
They should have been grieved over the sin. They should have addressed the sin in love. And if the man didn't repent in their loving addresses, they should have removed him with great sorrow. They boasted instead. Now the sinner has grieved over his sin and repentance, and the church has felt sorrow. And Paul here in verse 5 is leading by example and not taking personally the effects of the wayward man's sins. And it is possible that Paul may have had great cause to be personally offended, both by the man and by the church. Now there's a lot of debate about what happens between the writing of 1 and 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was written at Ephesus. Judaizers soon arrived at Corinth and stirred up opposition to Paul. And then Timothy came from Corinth to meet Paul at Ephesus. Paul then sent Titus to Corinth from Ephesus to meet Paul at Troas. Paul went to Troas, couldn't find Titus, and he went to Macedonia. Paul wanted to know what was going on at Corinth after he wrote the first letter. Titus finally found Paul at Macedonia and gave the report. Paul was relieved. To hear the report of this man, to hear the report of the church's obedience... And so Paul wrote 2 Corinthians from Macedonia in response to Titus' good report. Titus then took the letter to Corinth, and then Paul eventually went back to Corinth where he wrote the letter to the Romans. And why is all of this important? It shows Paul's deep concern for the church, even when there was personal opposition to him in the church. You see, the Corinthian church, for their love of favorites, had even gravitated towards people who opposed Paul and his apostolic authority and the truths that he proclaimed. They maligned Paul behind his back. They lied about his motives. They lied about his greed. They lied about his morality. They had taken up cases against Paul in Corinth so that he was misunderstood in his integrity and his intentions. And the way Paul appeals to the Corinthian church here just drips with compassion and with selflessness, not self-protectiveness or vendettas. He loved them. Some may have felt in Corinth because of the seriousness of the sin, maybe even because they had taken up offense for Paul, that the appropriate response to this man should be severity, harshness, or shunning. And the second feature here that we'll look at is a corrective to that. What should the church's disposition have been towards this man? Number two, they should be satisfied with repentance. They should be satisfied with repentance. Look at verse six. Paul says, sufficient for such a one is this punishment by the majority. The punishment is sufficient. The word punishment here, or penalty, this is the only time the word is used in the New Testament. It is a legal term, and it indicates that the church went through a formal process of removal. That is, they made a public statement regarding the man's sin, and a public removal of him from the gathering of the church. Uh, This was not just the man wandering off secretly into the sunset. This is a verbal, public official statement by the church of expulsion. And it's likely that some months went by before the man repented. Sometimes certainly elapsed before Paul could hear from Titus about the situation. And Paul calls this the penalty exercised by the majority. The the word can either mean majority or the many. It can mean the whole church agreed with this, or it can mean there were some people who weren't quite sure. This is really hard. Should we really be doing this? Whether it was a majority or as the word may mean, just the group, the many of them, the church decided to remove him. That is, the church was obedient to Paul's injunction and the immoral man was expelled. Notice here the man is unnamed, sufficient for such a one. There are other places where Paul names names. Hymenaeus and Alexander, Dimitri, uh, Demetrius. But here, this man is just called such a one. And the sin is unmentioned. 
Paul felt free to mention other sins in other places, but here in the case of the repentant man, the man is unnamed and the sin is unmentioned. It is just generalized. And Paul says, sufficient is the punishment. What does that mean? It's enough. The goal was repentance. And the goal has been met. The result, therefore, ought to be restoration. In other words, the discipline process is over. There's nothing left to be done in discipline for the man. And this is in stark contrast to the perversion of the church discipline process, which became the anathema and excommunication of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, claiming to have the keys to the kingdom in ways Jesus did not intend, went about the process of excommunication as a condemnatory judicial process, a declaration that the man they excommunicated is damned to hell forever. Listen, that's not a pronouncement a church can make. That's not information that humans are privy to. We don't know the eternal state of an individual. And as long as a man is alive, there is hope by God's design. And so, biblical church discipline is provisional. It is a very serious and sober warning for a man that the path you're on if you've stiff-armed the church is apostasy leading to eternal destruction. That is a warning. That is the road you're on. But with that warning comes the hope. Get off the path. Turn around. Come home. So biblical discipline is provisional, it is hopeful, it is restorative. It is a warning of future judgment, but not a consignment to future judgment. And so with that cannot come a a view of penance. Penance, again, is that medieval Catholic doctrine where you've got to pay things to get back on the right track. You've got to do some good works to make up for what you've done. You've got to pay some price. That is not the biblical gospel, that is not biblical sanctification, that is not the biblical church discipline process. There is no penance to be rendered, there are no payments to be made. And listen, in church history, churches have gotten this wrong. At times, churches have felt like some sin was so grievous that they had to inflict some sort of artificial duration of excommunication. Well, for this sin, you can't come back for seven years. Or that sin, you're banished for life. That's not the biblical model. In fact, that contravenes the gospel that we love. The good news. What is the good news for sinners in Jesus Christ? That he came to earth to pay for sin. Do you understand what that means? Jesus as a substitute at the cross takes upon himself every sin, past, present, and future of everyone who would ever believe and pays for them. As Matt said this morning in the communion meditation, he erases the debt. The debt is canceled. The wrath of God hanging over those sins is extinguished, exhausted, swallowed up in the infinite love of Jesus Christ at the cross. If, as we sing, Jesus paid it all, there's nothing left for a sinner to pay. There is no more debt to render back. And so therefore, there is no infliction of punishment or repayment that a church can leverage against a sinner who repents. Jesus paid. We don't make people pay. And this repentance and return of the wayward brother, of the prodigal believer, is exactly what we've been praying for. Repentance party, a celebration. The alternatives to that are vindictive, hypocritical, and judgmental. Listen, the only way to simultaneously simultaneously maintain the purity of the church's witness, the fellowship of forgiven sinners, 
and a community of grace and compassion. The only way you get all three of those is to follow God's directions for dealing with sin. You call sin, sin. You help each other see our blind spots. We meet each other. You follow the checklist like we talked about last week. There's a freedom, a beauty, a safety in following God's directions. And those directions include what to do when a brother repents. And it's beautiful. God's plan for the church when a removed brother turns back is to receive him in love. That leads to the third feature of the church's disposition towards the repentant brother. The church ought to be eager to express love. Look down at verses 7 and 8. Paul says, So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow, Wherefore, I urge you, reaffirm your love for him. What should the church do when the man turns back? Forgive and comfort. Paul leads this off with, on the contrary. On the contrary to what? Contrary to being vindictive, hypocritical, and judgmental. Make him pay. No, on the contrary, forgive and comfort. Forgive here means to grant gracious favor. It's built on the word grace. To comfort means to come alongside, to give cheer, to give courage, to give comfort. And the incentive here from Paul is, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. The word for overwhelmed here means to be swallowed up. It's used of ravenous animals swallowing up prey. It's used of large ocean waves swallowing up ships. What would it be like for a a man to drown in a sea of sorrows. Paul here is invoking sympathy, putting himself in another man's shoes. He, he's concerned for the condition of the man's heart. And what would be the effect of being overwhelmed and, and drowning in unnecessary sorrow? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Same letter, a couple paragraphs up the page. Paul knew sorrows. He says, We do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia. We were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. And God used that excessive sorrow in Paul's life to produce a profound trust in the Lord. But Paul didn't want to leverage the same kind of sorrow on another brother. His compassion for the offending brother is real and it is informed by his own sorrows. Bear in mind here that Paul is directing the church in its corporate actions. What it pronounces together in its gathering. You see, every individual Christian ought already to have forgiven the man in his heart before God. But what is needed, in addition to personal, individual forgiveness, is the formal expression of love and reinstatement by the gathered church. And and we love forgiveness, don't we? As C.S. Lewis said, we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. Forgiveness can be hard. Bearing grudges comes naturally. Hard-heartedness, bitterness, resentment, those things come easy. Forgiveness can be costly. And here Paul enjoins a corporate expression of this forgiveness. Look at verse 8. Therefore I urge you, reaffirm your love for him. Reaffirm your love for him. You see, in 1 Corinthians 5, there was, a, there was to be a formal statement of sin. This man by name and his sin by name. And then a formal removal from fellowship. But now there is to be a formal procedure whereby the church expresses its collective love for him. Affirming his place in the body of Christ. This word reaffirm here in verse 8 is a legal term. And it means to ratify an agreement by a formal decree. 
It was used at times of the pronouncement uh, reached by a vote of a group of people at times. And this means it is to be a very public, even procedural statement of love and reinstatement of the brother. That means the church could not rely on inferences, insinuations, hints and allegations. You know, he shows up at church on a Sunday morning and nobody locked the doors. Hey, uh, nobody yelled at him. See, we're, we're okay with him. No, that, that's not enough. There must be a clear, out loud, procedural, formal, contractual statement. This man is to be welcomed and loved and received and embraced and reinstated in the membership of the church. And it is to bind the church. And this is really important. We might think that we're expressing love by hints, by not not saying some things, and that's not enough. It can't just be obvious, it has to be stated. So Paul directs the Corinthian church to intentionally, officially, procedurally welcome the repentant man into, into fellowship, express forgiveness, give him comfort, encouragement, and reaffirm their love for him, ratify their love. This love here, this agape love is the word here. This is the great fundamental feature of the Christian life. This is the thing that marks out Christians in the world. This feature is how the world is to know that we follow Jesus. We have love for one another. One pastor has said, It is just as much a scandal to withhold love from a repentant brother as it is to let open sin go unchecked in the church. Either one of those would be scandalous. There is a fourth feature of the church's disposition towards the repentant brother. It's found in verses 9 and 10. It's simply an attitude of embracing the process. The church must embrace the process. Look at verse 9. For to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. This follows on the heels of verse 8. Paul is telling the Corinthian believers... Reaffirm your love for him with this explanation. For, to this end I wrote, and I believe he's referring back to 1 Corinthians 5 and the particulars there. Why did Paul write? To put the Corinthians to the test. Now, what does this mean? If the goal of all of this was love, love for the church, love for the public corporate witness before Jesus Christ, love for the world to be preaching the gospel with integrity before the world, and love for the man, even the expulsion of the man, motivated by love for the man, so that his soul may be saved, then the end of this process must also be motivated by love. In fact, all the more. Now that the offender has repented, love him. This is step five of the same process. The goal has been reached. He has repented. Love him. This is why I wrote. And look at verse nine. Paul says, that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient. You see, this process is as much about the church as it is about the man. This is why the reformers believed that The practice, the regular practice of church discipline was one of the marks of a true church. Different from medieval Roman Catholicism and anathemas and excommunication. But committed to integrity and holiness as a body of believers. And a church that isn't doing church discipline is no true church. And that perspective has been lost in our day. So few churches practice this process and even fewer churches practice it well. And for the Corinthian church, this was a test of their character. Look at verse 9. Put you to the test. The word for test there is a word Paul uses often for the, the, the testing unto approval. It's the same word used in Romans 12. You may test and approve what God's will is. You have to use two English words to describe the one Greek word. Because testing is the kind of testing used in metallurgy when you would heat up some precious metal 
And the impurities would rise to the surface and then be scraped off. And the heat would be applied again and impurities would come to the top and it's scraped off. It was a word that used the very difficult, painful, fiery process of bringing about a pure product. Did the fire test whether or not there were impurities? Yes, it revealed the impurities. But the testing was also used to remove the impurities. Uh, The same word was used of the Roman soldiers. Uh, They were tested by sort of hell weak seal, uh, Navy seals, testing, proving grounds. If you've ever been to San Diego and you've seen the guys rolling around there in in the cold water and the sand being brutalized, they're being tested to see if they make the grade, whether they can be seals. But in the testing is actually the development of their character that makes them the kind of men who are ready for the kinds of things they must do. That's how the word was used in the Roman army. Roman soldiers were tested and shown to be of quality by that process. And and this here, Paul says, I wrote this to you to put you to the test, Corinth. The church discipline process is hard But if you do it, and you do it well, and you do it the right way, in a God-honoring way, with hope and with love, what does it demonstrate? What does that hard, fiery, difficult, challenging process do in your life? It produces and proves the character of the church. So Paul said this was a test. If the Corinthians would be obedient in expelling the immoral brother from their midst then Paul could have have hope that all the other difficult aspects of his instructions to them in the letter to 1 Corinthians might be heeded. Again, Paul wrote that letter with tears. It was hard for him to write. He took no joy in the difficult instructions, instructions that he needed to give and that they needed to heed. Paul had his own concerns about how they would feel about him. Would his words be received? This really hard case of church discipline may have been particularly difficult for the Corinthians. The man in the church had the incestuous relationship with his father's wife, and he was likely a prominent figure, perhaps wealthy, Uh, Perhaps it was a matter of pride that the Corinthians included him as their own. So to remove him would have been costly. Celebrity status and wealth can purchase a pass on integrity and upright living in churches. Well, that guy's really influential. He's a big giver. He's the celebrity that actually draws people to our community. Look, if, if XYZ celebrity is there, maybe other people will come. It's an attraction Such a man would have been difficult to remove. I saw this firsthand during my time in Nashville. In the churches throughout the city, there was open scandalous living. It was in the newspapers, it was in the reports, it was in the gossip. Everybody knew about it. You see, in Nashville, everybody went to church. And so there was sin unaddressed because of the celebrity status of people in churches, music stars, record label executives, athletes, NASCAR drivers, Christian authors, directors of publishing companies, they all went to church. In fact, we had little names for churches named after the, the band or the, the celebrity, the, the, the artist that went there. This is so-and-so's church, referring to contemporary Christian music star. And there were some, not all, but there were some who lived openly scandalous lives. And the churches didn't discipline them because the celebrity was the draw. Even doing special music on Sunday mornings. The the, the stages of churches became something like a proving ground for record deals. It may have been so at Corinth. They were infatuated with image and entertainers, and those who could hold their attention. Paul told the Corinthians that they were boasting in this man when they should have removed him from the church. It seems quite likely that he held some social status in their community that they were proud to have. So what would the church do? Obedience to this directive from Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 was as much about them as it was about the sinning brother. And what a relief it must have been to Paul to discover they had passed the test. 
With Titus' report, it was clear the character of the Corinthian church proved of good quality in the end. So much so that Corinth became Paul's home as he penned the letter to the Romans. Look at the last part of verse 9. Whether you are obedient in all things. You see, this is a matter of obedience. Obedience to the Matthew 18 process that Jesus laid out. By the way, think about Matthew 18 in the, in the scope of your Bible, the, the sequence of Revelation. Matthew 18 is actually the first formal instruction given to the church. Matthew 16 is the first reference to the church in your whole Bible. Jesus there promised, I will build my church and it will succeed. Matthew 18 is the second reference to the church in all of Scripture. And it is the first set of instructions. Well before the church was even founded in Acts 2. And so this is a matter of obedience. Churches that neglect to follow Jesus' instructions can't hope to have the blessing of that obedience. Look at verse 10. Paul says, The one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. This is magnanimity in Paul. That is, he's... He's not thinking about himself. There's bigger things in the world than how Paul feels or or is offended. And, And Paul here dislodges the issue from himself and places it rightly in the role of the church. He entrusted the formal process to the local church, which is an interesting window into the New Testament view of the autonomy and responsibility of individual local congregations. Paul the Apostle here is entrusting this man and everything to the church's process. He's not holding a grudge. Whatever the church is ready to do in regard to forgiveness, Paul has already been ready. The Corinthians need not fear that if they reinstate the repentant brother, they might offend Paul's personal sense of justice. He wants to relieve their conscience. Reinstate the man. The second half of verse 10 We see that he trusts the process and they are to trust the process and we are to trust the process. He said, for indeed what I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. That is, on your account, this is for you, church. Any one individual in the church can't hold on to a grudge or harbor bitterness, desire a pound of flesh, or satisfy your personal sense of justice or vengeance. Now the individual Christian, even the brother most harmed, I think there's a reference to the brother most harmed in 2 Corinthians 7, it is most likely the sinning man's father, cannot hold a grudge. And this forgiveness is to be done in the face of Christ, uh, before Christ, in, in Jesus' presence. Remember Jesus said about the process, I will be with you wherever you gather for this purpose. That is a comfort. A comfort because this process is so difficult. But the special presence of Christ in the church discipline process is also an accountability We do all of this as those who will give account to Jesus. We carry out his process of discipline in his church by his methods, recognizing that he scrutinizes our motives and our faithfulness. We do this in the presence of Christ. And then finally in verse 11, we have a a final feature of the church's disposition towards the repentant brother. We ought to be wary of Satan's schemes. Look what Paul says in verse 11. So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. And we're not ignorant of his schemes. What are Satan's schemes here? They're they're not stated outright. Notice that they're plural. Whatever Satan's schemes are, he has more than one. There was one scheme in particular to the Corinthian situation that would have been pointed. That is a division between Paul and the church that would have had devastating consequences. The Corinthian church, if it had followed the Judaizers, if it had been taken advantage of by Satan and had taken up a cause against the Apostle Paul, 
That would have been devastating for the church. They would have been effectively removing themselves from apostolic authority, the foundation of the church in the first century, uh, the New Testament doctrine upon which we all depend. They would have been stiff-arming the truth of God revealed through Paul. That would have been a disaster, a catastrophe for the church. There's another scheme that Satan can be about. And in this command to forgive, Paul's personal example of forgiveness leading the way, it indicates to us that one scheme of Satan may be to overwhelm the repentant man with sorrow, to heap shame and scorn and reproach upon him such that he could not bear it. And with no help or support from his brothers and sisters in Christ, if he's still on the outs, Or maybe if he's let in only to see in their faces scorn and rejection. The man would perhaps be lost and bewildered. Sidelined in the Christian race. Unfruitful, miserable, despairing of life. Losing out on the benefits of spiritual life in the body of Christ. And Satan would win. Even after the man gives up his sin. Because the church refuses to obey and to love him. Perhaps another scheme of Satan is in play here. Notice that we might be taken advantage of by Satan. That is, we together corporately. Satan may have in his crosshairs not just the relationship of Corinth to Paul or the repentant man, but the church corporately. The church corporately are the losers. We can become victims of the life-stifling shenanigans of the accuser of the brethren. We lose out on the joys of reconciliation, the expressions of forgiveness and grace and love. You see, reconciliation, after hardship, after relational difficulty, after sin and after repentance, the reconciliation that happens is so sweet. It reflects the gospel reconciliation we experience towards God. And we get to experience it horizontally. Listen, we will not be able or allowed to sin against each other in heaven. And that'll be good. But for now, while we do sin against each other, let's at least benefit from the sweetness of reconciliation that comes by confession and repentance and the restoration of relationship. This is designed by God. It's invigorating. And the church loses its vitality of love. Again, the mark of true disciples of Jesus The church would lack integrity in its message, proclaiming a gospel of God's grace, yet holding offenses over others as though they still had something to pay. Uh, That's hypocrisy. That's a slander to the message of the gospel that we hold dear. That is a scheme of the devil. There is perhaps another scheme of the devil in this, and that the church would lose the man himself. You see, if the church discipline process is carried out in love, then the church will be on a hair trigger to express love. And if the church fails to respond in love in a timely manner when the man is repentant, it reveals a flaw that existed in the church's process all along the way. A lack of love. A failure at hope. A failure at the very purpose of the discipline process, which was restoration. And the result, the man may depart the community altogether. And the church would lose a precious member because it failed to love. And Satan would get the advantage over the man, over the church. Notice the last part of verse 11. We are not ignorant of his schemes. In other words, we shouldn't be. It would be irresponsible for us to not have a robust Satanology from the Bible. Who is he? What does he do? What is he up to? What are his schemes? What are his plans? How does he operate? We would be naive, dangerously naive, to think that Satan works in some far off place in some demonic religion somewhere else. Now throughout the pages of the New Testament, Satan is acquainted with the church, infiltrating the church, involved in the church, And he wants to take out leaders. He wants to take out the women's ministry in 1 Timothy 5. He is personal. He is active. He is a roaring lion roaming the earth seeking someone to devour. Now he's not omnipresent and he's not omniscient. 
He's not everywhere and he doesn't know everything. But he's smarter than we are. And he's been around a long time. And he has helpers. He takes aim at the church. We would be irresponsible to be ignorant of his schemes. What is at stake in all of this? Love. Grace. Forgiveness. An incentive to repentance. Listen, everybody that must be removed from the church needs to know that when they come back, it's a party. It is a celebration that there are wide open arms and warm hearts here because of the gospel. Because we have prayed for you. Because we love you and we long for you to come back. In our day, I know it's easy for a believer to sin, to stiff arm the church, and just go find another assembly. So few churches practice the process. Even fewer churches practice the process according to Scripture. So that the effects of removal and return of a wayward member are all but lost in our day. Just go across the street, go somewhere else. Be embraced, be welcomed. You don't have to repent. But you and I are not free to adjust the approach. We must simply, in faith, follow Jesus' instructions. I'm so thankful we have 2 Corinthians 2, this window into step 5 of the process. The welcoming back of a repentant brother. It ought to produce in us a community eager for reconciliation, for celebration. A community that has pleaded and prayed and then had to go through a hard process of removing a beloved brother and then prayed some more. But the brother comes back and it's time for the fatted calf, the robe and the gold rings. It's time to throw a party. A couple weeks ago, I stood on a beach on a shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was likely the beach where Jesus restored Peter after Peter had denied with curses that he even knew Jesus. I can't, can't help but think of my own weakness, my own failings, our own denials of Christ, our own unbelief, our own sin. And Jesus Christ, the one most offended by our sin, infinitely offended, is the one who is most eager for our repentance. And he is the one who runs and rejoices when the prodigal returns. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are good and you love your church. And we are so often myopic, narrow-minded. We don't have the big picture. We don't see as we should. We, we don't love like you do. We don't believe what we ought. Oh Lord, help our unbelief. Increase our love. Make our faith bigger. After you laid out the process for church discipline, Peter asked about individual grievances and he said how often do I have to forgive my brother we feel that sometimes and when we stop oh Lord and think about who we are and what we've done and what we've been forgiven we ought never hold over another something that must be paid your grace has been free to us and overwhelming, we have landed in a flood of love and kindness under the banner of your grace. May we be marked by and practice these very things. For the building up of your church and for your glory, for the witness of your son to the ends of the earth until he returns. Amen.